Welcome back to the Winter Growers Podcast. On today's episode, I speak with Brian Campbell of Uprising Seeds in Linden, Washington. Located in the Pacific Northwest, Brian and his partner Christine first started as a fresh market farm in 2004, producing their first seed catalog in 2007, and then transitioned entirely to seed production in 2011. Uprising Seeds is Washington's first 100% certified organic seed company, producing over 70% of the seeds they sell, with the rest being sourced from a network of regional family farms. Brian is passionate about exploring the relationship between grower security and open pollinated seeds, and the ability to seasonally adapt varieties to climactic conditions specifically through seed work. With a wealth of cool, climate-appropriate biodiversity that already exists, they focus extensively on radicchio, cabbage, overwintered cauliflower, onions, and beets as winter-adapted crops. Brian is also involved with a collaborative project between Uprising Seeds, the Culinary Breeding Network, and Northern Italian vegetable breeders Smarties Bio to further establish radicchio as an anchor crop for the fall and winter seasons in North America. Overall, this is a great conversation for better understanding how seed production and selection can affect winter crop production. This episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by Seed Time. Have you ever struggled with the timing of winter crops and planning your succession plantings? I've been playing around with a new crop planner called Seed Time that makes it so incredibly easy for home gardeners and market farmers alike to visualize when to seed, transplant, harvest, and more all year round. If you'd like to save a ton of time and avoid headaches planning and growing your crops, get your free Seed Time account with a $5 free seed coupon at seedtime.us forward slash no till podcast. That's seedtime.us slash no till podcast. This episode is also brought to you by Vermont Compost Company. Since 1993, Vermont Compost Company has grown from a small local operation to a company supplying premium living soils to thousands of successful growers all over the country. Combining meticulously crafted compost with intentional sourcing of the highest quality materials and amendments, Vermont Compost Company consistently delivers organic growers the soils their businesses depend on. In addition to product consistency, growers can count on Vermont Compost to provide the technical expertise it takes to make your organic farm flourish. Visit vermontcompost.com to learn more. Why grow alone? All right. Enjoy the show. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the Winter Growers Podcast. Hey, Clara. Thanks for having me. Well, it's really good to have you here. This is going to be a little bit of a departure from some of my guests because uh, your company, Uprising Seeds, is doing primarily seed production. Uh, You're located in the Pacific Northwest. And I think I reached out to you originally because I was really curious about the perspective of, you know, as a seed producer, how you are selecting for cold hardiness and for adaptability to winter growing. So it'll be great to get your perspective on that a little bit and, um, yeah, learn more about kind of what inspires you about this work, um, especially with climate change. Definitely. Yeah, I'd love to get started. Um, I always love to hear more about people's background, how they, you know, where you grew up, uh, what were your sort of early influences in plants and gardening, farming, um, did you come from a farming background at all, um, you know, or did you really just jump right, you know, dive headfirst into all of this <laughs> and figure it out as you've gone? Yeah, um, my path to it was pretty slow and meandering. Um, I grew up in Connecticut in a pretty um, rural town that was in a lot of ways defined by agriculture. So it definitely like grew up in a setting of like active local agriculture, the big industry sort of agriculture there was tobacco, but there were lots of dairies and small vegetable farms as well that were sort of part of the culture of that place. Um, I would say I didn't really take a big interest in it until probably college. And um, 
became pretty interested in like food systems as a sort of field of study. Um, but I'm really most satisfied as a producer of things. Um, I like to have sort of like tangible things that um, I work on. So pretty quickly gravitated towards farming. Um, and like probably a lot of people who don't come from um, agricultural backgrounds sort of scaled up naively um, from gardening to farming and all the learning curves that come with uh, trying to make, um, you know, gardening, scaling to farming work on a um, commercial basis um, as a to make a living doing that. So um, we started farming on our own, my partner Christine and I, probably about 20 years ago um, in Washington. But prior to that, you know, had some stints working on farms in Oregon and uh, Vermont as well, kind of in the meantime. And what, you know, what was kind of your interest back then with it? Did you did you think you wanted to eventually start your own farm or were you really just kind of wanting to learn? Yeah, I think I did. Um, I think, you know, uh, studies through high school and college kind of focused on hard sciences. I was really interested in biology and botany and ecology. Um, but just in terms of um, career interests, I really just saw that as something I could really get behind. Um, and that was sort of at a time in the 90s where um, there was starting to be a real movement for local agriculture and a real interest in local agriculture um, and sort of, a, I would say, just a lot of energy around sort of small scale diversified farming, um, for better or worse, uh, as a sort of defining feature of local food economies. Um, so, yeah, kind of seeing that and um, having the interests I had, I, I definitely kind of knew pretty early on, I, I feel like post-college, that that was what I was interested in doing. And who were some of your early mentors or even some of the farms that you worked on or who was the most influential on you? Um, I actually spent some time at the Intervale in Burlington, um, which I thought was um, inspired not just because of its relationship with the community as sort of a community center in Burlington, but just also as a really cool atmos collaborative atmosphere of growers. Um, that was sort of my first experience with sort of an incubator farm scene and lots of people um, sharing resources um, just as a model of growing. Um, and I really liked that. Um, we got pretty interested in seed um, seed work pretty early on. And so a lot of my positive influences uh, in that, there was a really pretty r rich um, group of, of people working in seed in the Pacific Northwest, which is where we started um, getting interested in that. So um, like the old Abundant Life Seed Foundation, which was based out of Port Townsend and sort of morphed over many years into OSA, um, doing more education and advocacy, but they were cl close by, really like um, inspiring kind of a small scale seed movement that paralleled in some ways the um, farm to market and local food systems um, kind of work, but um, relative to, to seed work. Um, so people like Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seed and John Navazio, who was then with the uh, Abundant life, um, and out in this area, were were real early mentors, and also there was kind of a group of um, seeds of change. Actually, was really early on, sort of a pretty pivotal um, company with uh, working with organic seeds. So there was a group of um, growers in the Pacific Northwest that were the early sort of contract growers for seeds of change, um, and were some of the people who had probably the most experience at that time working with seed in the context of organic agriculture. So yeah, a lot of resources in the Pacific Northwest at the time, for sure. 
Did you ever travel abroad during that time or have an interest in sort of studying some of the, you know, whether European or other, you know, seed or at least farming practices? I would say we were influenced from afar, but no, not in terms of like actually traveling to places and, you know, working on farms or experiencing that in person, but definitely inspired by sort of the cultural integration of farming and agriculture into um, into communities and places like Italy and um, Germany and England that we had traveled um, in the past, for sure. And so when you and Christine started, you were actually doing mo- more vegetable production or um, small vegetable production at that time. Is that correct? Yeah, we started as a fresh market farm, um, super small scale, maybe two acres. Um, primarily selling to like local co-ops and at farmers markets. Um, We went on to develop a CSA um, that was kind of unique in that we only had uh, customers that paid with um, EBT food stamp cards. Um, And that was sort of the whole design model of the CSA. And we ran that for a couple of years as well. Um, And slowly just started integrating seed work um, into our farm work as kind of a natural piece of the farm work puzzle and um, the balance just kind of shifted more heavily towards that over the years until we finally gave up the fresh market and shifted uh, completely to the seed work so it was kind of a a transition of several years before we felt confident that the seed work could pay the bills and and float a successful uh, farm business for us. But eventually that's kind of what we settled on as our, as our primary work. And that's been about maybe 12 or 13 years now since we've been exclusively sort of uh, seed as our primary market crop. And what, you know, where were your sources of seeds before that? Um, Did you notice, you know, challenges with the seeds that you were receiving and, I mean, I guess I'm always curious about sort of that adaptability and open pollinated and being able to grow them out in the area that you grow in and how that can be so advantageous as a grower. But, you know, the process itself to be able to to do that is an extra challenge for a grower, too. It is. Um, I would say that we started our farm with just a really strong sense of sort of it being an ideology directed business of, you know, really wanting to dive deep into organic practices, into social justice, into um, just really trying to create a business that lived, that sort of promoted and, and became a platform for the values that we wanted to live in our lives. And the difficulty in sourcing organic seed played actually a big part in us becoming interested in the seed work. Um, And, you know, honestly, as sort of not really complex thinking as it sounds, um, it was really kind of a DIY mentality um, of starting to get involved in seed work of like, there's this thing that we buy that we can produce ourselves. And why would we buy it in when we can, you know, produce that on the farm. And, you know, obviously as a farming culture, we've kind of gotten away from seed work as being just a normal part of farm work. Um, But coming into it kind of naively as why wouldn't we do that if we can have a good climate for it? You know, we uh, like salad mix was a really heavy component of our early fresh market production. And you obviously use a ton of like lettuce seed, mustard seeds. We live in a great climate to grow that. They're, you know, relatively uncomplicated to grow once you um, spend a little time um, learning that skill set. And so that was really a lot of what sort of fueled our um, initial interest. And um, I think working with plants from the full spectrum of seed to seed just creates a real different relationship. over the seasons uh, with those crops. And for us, felt like a really sort of um, holistic, 
component of farming that we really wanted to integrate into our work. So, I mean, it, I realize it's not so common and in a lot of ways, what, um, what I'm really interested in is not having seed companies and uh, breeders be sort of these externalized um, sort of specialists. And I want, uh, I would love to see that sort of more return to um, farms as um, sort of where these genetic resources are maintained, where these relationships are maintained. In a lot of ways, I feel like the farming community has abdicated that role to specialists. And I would love to see that kind of reclaimed on farms. And that was a lot of the inspiration with, um, with how we got started with it. So do you think that a small farm can do both well? I think, you know, I think it's probably naive to think that you can be, that you can produce all your seeds for your farm. Um, but I feel like every farm has, sort of a signature crop or something that's a real specialty or something that has a lot of meaning to them. And I think absolutely, you know, that's something that I, I would love to see more of is um, people gain those skills to where they're maintained um, on farm. And then it becomes a real personal relationship, you know, then the, the farmer and the, you know, the, the farmer and what's important to them and the, and the plant and how that's grown on the farm. Like, those genetics become intertwined over generations and um, it's really kind of living in relationship with those, with those plants more than continually having that be an externalized thing that, you know, is uh, bought in every year and more of an input than sort of a relationship. Um, so I think, I think absolutely. And I, I get really excited about farms who are market farms and, and we've got plenty of examples of that out here of um, farms that are, you know, even big commercial production farms that, you know, have a program of they know what they want more than seed companies know what they want and their ability to do those selections on farm and um, really select what is important to them in terms of traits and really adapt it to their local climate. And I think that's a fantastic component of food security that could um, really be integrated into a lot of fresh market farm work sort of structure. Do you have recommendations for, you know, new farmers and how they would set up their farm so that they could do both well? I mean, what, what would be some of the thoughts that, that should be on their mind to, because you know, most people do kind of go more specifically with market gardening and that's the approach, the production. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, do you have any, you know, if you, if you were to receive that advice early on, what would you tell young farmers to do right off the bat? You know, I think it's, I think it's a matter of, especially like, like I said, with those crops that really become like the identities of farms. Um, I think it's part of just building the relationship with those plants. And um, I, I think it seems like totally reasonable to me to, once you are producing on a commercial scale, a crop and really getting to know it, just recognizing how to look for, for example, plants that really exemplify the traits you're looking for and um, set those aside or transplant those into a separate bed that will become a seed bed and, um, you know, kind of just integrate that work. It's just a different way of thinking about the way we relate to plants and a different way to sort of integrate that work into sort of the cycle of of the produce farm because seed work really does it moves at a different scale of time and it's it it's a different cycle to wrap your head around than sort of production farming so it takes a little bit of um it's a different way of thinking um and it's a it's 
much longer term um, in terms of it being both in the ground longer to produce seed and also as genetic work sort of longer multi-generational um, in terms of seasons work to sort of wrap your head around uh, in terms of making progress and steering <laughs> steering genetics uh, towards desired traits and um but yeah i think it's totally manageable within the context of a of a market farm and you know it has been for generations so i don't know <laughs> why why it couldn't be again well i'll i'll give you um you know my dad has always said uh he hasn't been as interested with seed production because he would rather have the professionals do it that's kind of what yeah. he he says so you know fair yeah. enough right um sure. but one of the crops that we have played around with at the farm is um you know based on winter production is what we call now our winter sweet kale mm -hmm. and it was a, a kale variety we sourced from uh, adaptive seeds. It was called Western Front. Mm -hmm. And it had very, you know, uh, frilly leaves and we wanted more weight. So mm -hmm. there were some that were more broad. And so growing it through the winter, we would select the the broader leafed uh, plants and let them seed out. Um, and then we've collected the seeds every few years that we can get around to, you know, doing that. But it is challenging because it's in our high tunnel and we sure. need to clear that space out to put in the summer crops. So sure. then we end up transplanting them, <laughs> you know, either into some other part of the farm or into pots. And it just, sure. you know, creates, you know, definitely a hassle. So it is interesting to see like how if you were so market focused, how it yeah. really does affect, you know, how you do your, pro you know, your process. And um, it's kind of a pain in the ass, honestly. <laughs> yeah, totally. It, I mean, it is. And it's extra work to... For sure. But like um, an example of, I guess there's lots, you know, it's so different for every crop, but um, Nash Huber out at Nash's farm in uh, Squim out on the peninsula in Washington was a great example of um, a pretty large scale vegetable farm. Um, and, you know, they would grow lots of brassicas, lots of roots. Um, and just had the context of really big fields to walk. And when you grow on that scale and have, you know, these huge populations, you really can go through and get a good sense of like what the perfect plants are. And I think um, he just had the foresight in really wanting to have long-term relationships with these varieties that were really commercially important to him where he would go through and flag the perfect ones and just have his crew dig them up and plant them into nursery beds. And at least in our climate, um, you know, it's an extra step, but it really is not that much work. And over the years, I mean, he's growing or had been growing OP cabbages on a commercial scale of like acre multiple acre sized fields and it's like you can't get op cabbages in any of the commercial seed catalogs these days um and yet he's able to just have the foresight to really work with them do a lot of selection have big populations to work with and um they served his needs even as a big commercial grower so there's this sense that OP varieties are um, more, at least for a lot of crop types, are more like backyard garden and not really up to commercial standards. And so much of that, I feel like, is just a matter of um, commercial growers taking stewardship over those varieties and doing the seed work because it's just a it's a lack of attention and work. Um, more than it is just sort of like this natural inferiority of uh, open pollinated plants in those crops. So, but like, as your dad said, leave it to the experts. I mean, who is more of an expert in what you want for your farm than you, you know, like in my experience, the farmers are the experts. And I think developing the skills to either learn how to do the seed work and incorporate that in or at the very least sort of have these collaborative relationships with maybe people whose work is specializing in the seed work 
but having these sort of farmer breeder collaborations, um, I think is hugely valuable. Yeah. So you talk about this relationship with plants as, as a grower, what, how has that relationship developed for you over the years and what crops, what varieties have you really resonated with? Yeah. I mean, we've always built our, our business is more been less about what the market wants and more about what we're kind of crazy about and hoping we can drag other people along into our craziness. So, um, we, a lot of our passion is, um, with like varieties that have a real cultural context that they exist in. Um, I'm really, um, I'm really interested in uh, food culture and food traditions and food as this sort of uh, vehicle of cross-cultural connectivity and sort of creator of community and community identity. And so I've, um, my relationship with plants and uh, with the food crops is oftentimes based in that. Um, I get really interested in um, just long histories of varieties in place and what that means to those communities and how we can learn about each other and connect to one another over food. So um, that's the kind of things that we've sought out over the years um, and that I feel has drawn a lot of people towards us either as um, people who have been you know, displaced from those um, places where these foods are traditional and then finding them in our catalog and being really excited about them or people who are just sort of broaden their, broadening their um, interests in different cuisines and different cultures and seeking out um, those varieties, which are harder to find sometimes. Um, so I think that's the context a lot of times that that we've developed these relationships with plants. Um, for me, it's often food, food centered, like culinary centered, for sure. Yeah. And what, what are some examples? What, what are your top, top five or top five <laughs> in terms of, like plants or the crops? Yeah. What, what, what crops like, you know, do you, I guess, which ones do you love to grow and do you love to grow as a seed crop in particular? Yeah. Um, I, um, uh, we're obviously big fans of Radicchio, which we've mm -hmm. kind of developed a reputation for and have done a lot of work promoting. So we're pretty obsessed with that. Um, in terms of the seed crops I enjoy, um, we like brassicas a lot. And um, in terms of like getting interesting open pollinated brassicas out into the world, I feel like there's a a real lack of that. So that's something we take a lot of pride in. Um, I really enjoy like peppers and pepper diversity uh, an awful lot. Um, let's see what uh, beets. I feel like we spent a lot of time um, working on and, and have become, it's become maybe a specialty of our business is, is beet seed production. That's a handful. <laughs> Those are good. Now talk more a little bit more about those radicchios. Um yeah. I, I believe you also have there you have a collaboration with um the culinary breeding network and Smarties, is that correct? Yeah. And yeah. maybe talk a little bit more about that collaboration and how that's um influenced your your business. Yeah, definitely. Um Lane of Culinary Breeding Network is a dear friend and we've worked with her um for many years and have just been really excited about her work. Um which in a lot of ways is similar to what I was just talking about, um, kind of using um, culinary aspects of uh, farm crops and using that as a source of connectivity up and down the food chain. So farmers, um, breeders, um, restaurateurs and chefs and, and home cooks and just sort of creating all these unlikely bridges in, um, in the food community. Um, and getting people to collaborate more. And 
through Lane, we met um, Andrea Gadina, who is a Italian breeder um, that she met maybe about a decade ago. And he, in the last several years, had sort of branched out on his own and started a new um, company, Smarties, who they're definitely their specialty is radicchio, but they also do a lot of pretty interesting work paralleling our interests of, you know, Italy, of, of course, has a, a similar thing as the U.S., where a lot of the older farmers are aging out, um, but there, a lot of the real regionally specific crops that are real traditional to areas and sort of have these, you know, multi-generational associations and identities of place, um, all that seed was being maintained on farms and seeing that as a resource that was potentially being lost as there wasn't younger farmers to sort of take the mantle of maintaining these varieties. He he started what he calls a biodiversity project that's sort of applying modern breeding and selecting ideas to these traditional um, traditional varieties that have a real sense of place um, and then offering them through his seed catalog, which is really uncommon. Like you just, they're not seeds that you historically have been able to buy from a seed company. So um, as a resource, it's uh, it's pretty important and great work. Um, but we connected um, sort of through this mutual love of radicchio as a fall and winter crop, which is especially suited to where we grow in the Pacific Northwest um, and started working with uh, Andrea to import a lot of his seeds. And this sort of this um, golden period of the quality of seed kind of meeting the growing interest um, in radicchio production that um that's pretty exciting so um i think he's probably he must, probably is producing the widest line of certified organic radicchio seed which is pretty exciting because while the quality has been going up for some years um it was still hard to source organic seed so you know he's both doing breeding and organic and organic field systems um which is beneficial of course for um adapting it to um, organic conditions and also just uh, it's just great to be able to source organically grown seed for it so yeah and then you have at the pacific northwest where you're located you share a similar latitude to italy so you have you know very similar light conditions you're dealing with with those radicchios correct yeah definitely the veneto is pretty maritime you know it's very close to um venice and um the the west coast of italy so it's got this maritime influence and uh similar to the pacific northwest it's got pretty um slow transitions from fall to winter which is really beneficial um it's not like you know upper midwest or um northern new england or something where you know winter comes and hits hard <laughs> when it comes yeah. you know we've got these slow several month transitions um where it's not even like frosting every night um that's really beneficial so yeah we're trying to we're working hard to develop it as a real sort of identity crop in our area for for fall and winters and become less reliant on lettuces and and greens from california when we've got this great opportunity to produce greens um you know, really into February or even March up here. Today's episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by Johnny's Selected Seeds. Since 1973, Johnny's has supported farmers and gardeners with superior seeds, tools, and information to help ensure their growing success and help feed their communities and families. The research farm is at the heart of Johnny's, where they trial thousands of varieties and tools every year. Their breeding program uniquely focuses on introducing varieties that meet the needs or solve the challenges mixed market, small farmers, and avid gardeners face. Visit johnnyseeds.com for innovative new varieties and time-tested favorites to grow this season. You can also browse their online growers library, link in the description, for a wealth of free educational resources. The employee owners at Johnny's look forward to growing with you. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, 
Growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right, back to the show. So how many um, how many crops does your catalog sell, and how many are produced specifically on your farm? What you don't produce everything, correct? No, not everything. Um, you know, it's. We probably are up to, I don't have an exact number. I would say somewhere in the line of between 400 and 500 varieties in our catalog. And I'd say we produce probably 80% of those wow. um, on our farm, which is pretty significant, I'd say. Um, we have a group of growers that we've worked with in the Pacific Northwest. Um, to contract some of our seed production um, pretty much right from the beginning. Um, and we've been working with some of them for you know 15 years at this point. Um, but it's a pretty tight group. And in a lot of ways, we're shifting models and treating it less in sort of a traditional like transactional contract sense like i'm really to get back to kind of the same idea i'm i'm really trying to get to where farmers are taking more ownership of relationships with plants i, I don't want to be the specialist or sort of like the keeper of um you know the the highly selected stock seed and the person who's making um all the decisions and then sending the stock seed for just a contract grow out and then getting it back and then um having it be this transactional thing we're, at this point we're really the growers we work with we're trying to have them work with the same crops so if somebody produces a crop for us one year um you know we want them to start to take ownership of that and really work with it uh, over generations and really get to know it and sort of be the person who produces that crop for us. Um, you know, it seems like every year we have growers contact us that have this sense of, I'm looking to get into seed work and I have an isolation to grow beet seed and what's a beet that you need grown out. And I'm more interested in hearing from people like, I've got this crop that I've been growing for seed and I really love it. And here's what I've done with it. And I wonder if you'd be interested in me producing that for you. And that I feel like is much more sort of the relationship we're trying to get to with growers. And in a lot of ways that has been great with working with uh, Andrea at Smarties for just that reason is he's working in the cultural context of the crops that we're sourcing from him. He's got this rich knowledge of um, radicchio types and um, sort of the context context of that in agriculture of the Veneto, where it's from. And so it's really exciting for us to be able to um, sell that and sort of represent that sort of body of knowledge and experience and context that he brings to that seed. And, and I like to see that, you know, just even in, even in commercial vegetable growers here, just that sense of sort of ownership and relationship with plants is much more appealing to me than just trying to throw as many things at the wall and see how many stick and try and offer as many things as we can sort of, sort of attitude. So does that mean that you would act more as a distributor, so to speak, uh, for these small farms that want to produce a specific crop of seed to sell through you? I mean, is that kind of what you're thinking of? I, I, I'm trying to understand the relationship and like the business aspect of it too. I mean, in some regards, yeah. I, I think, you know, if we're growing 80% of 400 and however many varieties at this point, like you can really only do so many very well. Um, and I really like the idea of people taking crops and working with them long-term and really 
learning that, you know, just living in relationship with them and really learning how to do them well. Um, so while we might have ideas of what crops we would like those to be and we would like to sell through our catalog, um, having consistency of a grower who works with them regularly, I think is, uh, is a pretty appealing model to us. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think to some extent, um, I do enjoy maybe a seed business model that's almost like the equivalent of a seed hub where, um, we have an established business and if somebody has something they're really excited about um, that they're doing in seed work um, that really doesn't have much to do with us or that we haven't worked with, but, you know, maybe we've seen it or maybe we've trialed it um, and somebody's doing really good work, just the opportunity to be able to bring that to market, um, I think is, is pretty exciting actually. Yeah. So I'm curious about how, you know, cold hardiness and climate change and all of that has been maybe influencing your, the, how you select, um, for your seed sales. I mean, the, obviously Pacific Northwest has more of a maritime climate, but you know that there's a demand for more year round growing, especially in areas that have a harsher climate. So do you take that into consideration with any of your seed selection or, uh, yeah, I'm just curious how that sort of gets incorporated into your process. Yeah, we do. I mean, it's true. We have a pretty good climate here for winter production. Um, it's pretty mild. Um, although, you know, we do have some, I guess what, what would be considered extreme for here is like down to single digits um, occasionally. But you know, our business started out as being pretty regionally focused. And as we've grown, kind of naturally, um, people have found us from other places. So we have a pretty wide distribution now. But I would say that our approach, I'm, you know, there's two components probably of winter growing. One is sort of technique, um, and the other is sort of the actual plant genetics that you're working with. And I would say from like a technique perspective, I'm pretty interested in like low intervention stuff. Um, I'm not really into super high input winter production um, programs that are really heavily reliant on plastics or uh, additional heat or just a lot of sort of like resource infrastructure. So I would say maybe the way that that's reflected in the genetic work we do is that um, when we grow biennials like brassicas, which are pretty heavily featured in um, winter production programs, um, I mean, the biennial work is kind of the extreme of winter hardiness, right? Because it has to go through the whole winter <laughs> and survive to make seed. So a lot of that is is pretty laissez-faire, like leaving things in the field, um, you know, having nature take care of our cold hardy selections. And um, like I said, it needs to make it through a whole winter to produce seed. So a lot of that is sort of the natural natural selection of the seed work. Um, we're also, we do a lot of work with storage crops too. And again, things like, um, beets and onions, um, and other roots, um, you get a real sense of storage qualities just by the very nature of seed work. Cause again, um, you need to store roots through the entire winter cause they need to be replanted in. March or April for the most part. Um, so you really get these good sort of observational periods of like, for example, what onions sprout um, first in storage um, or like what um, beets go to seed first um, and, and traits like that that you might not get in 
might not see in just a vegetable production kind of situation. So a lot of it's built into just the very nature of the seed work, I'd say, but also just the way we tend to grow things. Um, we tend to be pretty hard on plants through the winter in the field and, and, you know, don't use a lot of real cover, don't use a lot of protected spaces, don't use tunnels really. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like that because if you're, you know, if things are surviving through the winter there, then they'll definitely survive in New England in a high tunnel or with, you know, under row cover. So, you know, sure. that, that is a good comparison to think about is, you know, if there's a little bit of protection for us, then your crops will definitely make it through. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a principle of seed work is you really, when you're doing your selection work, you want to grow them in a realistic climate that you want them to perform in. You know, you don't want to, you know, have these manicured, um, fields with no weed pressure and protected from, you know, frost. And you really want to test them out there in the real world. And, and that's where you really, that's really where you get kind of the visual performance separation of, of, you know, what traits are really going to make this, uh, make this a hardy crop and, and which ones are going to kind of require these sort of manicured conditions to, to really perform. What are some of your new varieties for 23 that you're super excited about? I was looking at your website earlier and I saw one variety, arugula variety called wasabi that caught my eye. And I was curious if that has any fun, yeah, we've, fun story. We've loved the wasabi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The wasabi arugula is great. Um, yeah, that was one of the ones we were most excited about this year just because it is such a unique flavor. Um I'm pretty excited about, which maybe ties a little bit into winter production, is uh, storage tomatoes as mm. a class of tomatoes. Which storage not tomatoes. Really... Yeah, say more. Yeah, it's, it doesn't seem like there's a, a super big culture around it here, but in, um, like, I think the primary places I've found that there's kind of a strong tradition of them are in Italy and then in uh, Spain, there's, you know, most people who are pretty into food culture have probably seen pictures of like hanging tomatoes, um, in kitchens in Italy or outside, uh, outside buildings. And, um, they tend to be like pretty high dry matter, thick skin tomatoes that, um, just last post harvest for often months and months and months. Um, they're often hung up kind of like ristras, but fresh, not dried, obviously. Um, and just kind of provide a tomato, fresh tomato source, you know, well past the season of field tomatoes. So we've been experimenting. The pianolos are kind of the, the classic ones um, that come from uh, near Napoli um, on the shoulders of Vesuvius. Um, and they're kind of like a saladette sized tomato with sort of a pointed uh, blossom end. Um, and then we have one that is part of our Gusto Italiano um, collaboration with, uh, with Smarties and Culinary Breeding Network that's sort of a more traditional round saladette sized. Um, but we've had them with not much care, you know, to conditions of storage and probably harvesting them riper than they should be for, for storage. We've definitely held them for three months and eaten fresh tomatoes around Christmas time. And I know they'll go several months past that with a little more probably care to conditions that you're doing it in. Wow. Yeah. Are, are those indeterminate? Um, they are indeterminate. Yeah. And so the strategy is maybe to pick them slightly, slightly underripe. Um, just so they're a little firmer and less resistant to, you know, kind of molding or, um, desiccation. And then, uh, yeah, we've had a, we've had a lot of luck with them and it's pretty, um, you know, they don't match the flavor of like a ripe mid season beefsteak tomato or something like that, but they're certainly, um, as good or better than anything you find at the supermarket that time of year. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I love the idea of being able to just store them in, you know, essentially what room temperature conditions. Um, yeah, so definitely talk about low yeah. input. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, in terms of storing them, you can either hang them up, which 
is a little bit of a process or just even in just kind of single layer, single layer flats stacked up in a, in a cool, cool dry spot. It's, it's great. So we're, we're continuing, um, trialing some, some new varieties of those just to try and hone in on what works best for us and how they store and which ones taste best. Uh, so that's kind of an ongoing project. We have a couple new ones in the rotation for this coming season that we're excited about. Yeah. So. I, I'm tempted to try those. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. And we continue, we continue to add radicchio. So there's always a couple of new radicchio in the catalog every year that we're excited about. Um, yeah. I also noticed on your website, you have a, a cool grow it forward program. Um, could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, we've always, wanted to incorporate an element of service to our community in our business and the economics of small production agriculture. A lot of times you just have to charge a price that you have to charge um, to make, to make your business financially solvent. And we've always wanted to not have lack of resources, um, prevent people from, being able to get seeds and being able to, you know, we see so much value in people growing food, uh, both from a mental health perspective, from a food security perspective. Um, so, I mean, grow it, buy it forward is kind of an established model in the world. Um, and so we have a, um, an item on our, in our online catalog that is, um, a packet, a package of, it shifts through the season, but it's, I believe it's five um, kind of seasonally relevant um, vegetables and that people can order uh, just for the cost. Uh, I think it's a dollar shipping. Uh, we had to charge just to make it work with sort of the mechanics of our checkout software. Um but so people can go on and and get a little bundle of of vegetable seeds for a dollar, and then um, the grow it forward part is that um, there's another separate thing that you can buy that basically is people funding that um, by um, contributing to that, and sort of as we have more people buy it forward, we're able to um, put more inventory of the, of the seed bundles that are available at no cost or just for the dollar for shipping. Um, and it's been great. And we've had a really super positive response to that. Um, and, uh, yeah, people, people appreciate having access to it that, um, maybe didn't feel like they had, um, funds to spend on, um, garden seeds that year. So that's been really satisfying. Yeah. No, I, I love it. I think it's a great program. Yeah. So um, thank you for doing that. <laughs> it's been good. That was uh, that was Christine's sort of brainchild and something she's been really passionate about. And speaking of Christine, what, um, what's been sort of her focus and passion with uh, your business and the farm and all of that? What, what do you think she contributes that's unique and special? Yeah, without totally speaking for her, I'd say that she is really driven by um, a sort of community service, social engagement, and kind of social justice component to the work. Um, I feel like I really easily get distracted into just sort of the botany wonk and um, sort of food, food and culture wonk side of things. And I feel like she's really remained centered in sort of our work as a work of service. Um, and it's really great to have, uh, feel like that's just a huge grounding part of our, um, of our business. And, um, and she never loses sight, loses sight of that, I would say is, uh, is probably something that I really value that she brings to the work. Um, and, and just that she's always sure to keep the work humble and kind of grounded in that, which I really appreciate. Mm. Well, thank you for that. 
Um, so I think we're just about to our lightning round. Are you ready for that? Ready for it. <laughs> okay. So number one is your favorite crop to grow, cook, or eat. Um, I'm going to surprise my radicchio <laughs> community by saying, well, I'm going to surprise a lot of people, but uh, cardoons are oh. probably, probably my number one favorite. Okay. Now to grow cook and eat or just yeah okay all three all three i mean i'm not <laughs> i'm a glutton for punishment when it comes to like crops that require the most attention <laughs> high so, maintenance. Like, for, totally high maintenance <laughs> like i'm the same way with cooking like recipes that start with like day one are the kind of recipes for me um so yeah i love like Forcing, blanching, anything that requires an obscene amount of work. I have kind of endless <laughs> patience uh, to, to dive into those projects. Do you have any secrets with the the blanching process of cardoons? I know sometimes that stumps people a little bit. What's your We go technique? kind of old school and, and tip them over and bury them, oh, which is okay. sort of a traditional way. We uh, wrap them to keep them a little bit clean, but then um, you dig a little trench next to them and kind of put a shovel next to the base and pry up the roots and tip them over. And then we just bury them in the soil. Okay. So how long do they also, stay that way? How, how long do they? About a month. Okay. Yeah. Month, month or so. Um, but it also has the added benefit of it gives them a little frost protection because they're um, under the soil at that point. So if you do get real, real hard frosts that could damage it, um, sometimes it'll protect them a little bit. And how do you like to prepare the cardoons? Uh, breaded and fried mm. <laughs> and a Ro Roman style. Um, yeah. You um, poach them in like a white wine, um, white wine and water and spices and herbs and, uh, and then bread them and fry them. Delicious. <laughs> so good. Uh, number two, what is your favorite tool? Uh, favorite tool. I'm going to have to choose Two, uh, one of them's the Winnow Wizard, which is a pretty specialized, like small scale seed cleaning tool that was developed by a friend, uh, Mark Lutera in Oregon. And it's um, a winnowing, winnowing tool that is, uh, is great. And another one is um, a Roto Ho, which is a chipper shredder that we use for threshing a lot of crops. Um, and we've got a great one that we had a, a friend convert to plug in. Um, they're usually like a gas powered, super loud thing. And we've got an electric plug in version now. That's pretty awesome. Great. Those those are new ones for the show. So thank you. <laughs> it's always good to yeah. get new. A lot of people will say, you know, their iPhone or <laughs> so it's good. Yeah, get yeah, going yeah. real old school here <laughs> and traditional. <laughs> yep. Yep. Totally. Uh, number four. Um, what is your or sorry, number three, what is your favorite way to relax or self-care activity? Or how do you take care of your body, heart, and mind as a farmer? Yeah, for me, time with family and time in the mountains. Um, Wintertime skiing, summertime climbing um, is kind of my recharge, recharge mode. So it's early March right now. Have you been enjoying the snow up in the mountains this winter? Skiing a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's been pretty great. Good. You've been getting some good, good uh, snow storms out there. Definitely. Yeah. We're blessed with abundant snow in the Pacific Northwest. Good. Uh, next one. What is your favorite smell and least favorite smell on the farm? Uh, favorite smell is carrot seed, hmm. which is amazing and would probably surprise a lot of people. It is absolutely divine. Um, least favorite smell are rotting onions. <laughs> and there are a lot of bad smells on a seed farm. <laughs> rotting onions is probably tops. <laughs> I like the carrot seed one. Um, I actually, one of my favorite smells is our carrots when you harvest them and yeah. you get that sort of earthy, sweet smell. Uh, but I never really thought about the seeds. I've never had enough, I guess. Yeah, open up a package of carrot seed and smell it. It's, it's. I mean, we obviously have huge bags of carrot seed, like twenty pound bags, 
um, to where you really get it intensely, but you'd probably smell it even in a packet of carrot seed. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I guess we use mostly pelleted <laughs> carrot yeah, seeds. I mean, so yeah, yeah. I'm like, darn. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll remember that next time with raw carrot seeds. Sure. Uh, next one. How do you turn off farming or can you, do you? We do. And it's actually become pretty easy for us over the years. Um, but the easiest way we've done it is always having a physical separation between where we live and where we farm. We've never um, we've never owned farmland and never lived on farmland. So at the end of the day, it's the end of the day and we're gone. So um, and I feel like the other way is having real hard boundaries um, and they've gotten kind of harder over the years i would say um and we've we've really harder to maintain or harder um more more firm boundaries firmer firmer (laughs) boundaries yeah good Uh, i I would say almost to an unhealthy extent Uh, (laughs) it's sometimes where you know obviously like with seed crops there is a lot that can go wrong and sometimes you know we'll get a rainstorm on a weekend that we could probably potentially get out before and harvest it. And we kind of just are like, it's too bad it's the weekend, or maybe we would be able to save that crop, but we don't work on weekends. So, <laughs> um, Good for you. That's, that's great. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Hard boundaries are important. Next. What would you be doing if you weren't farming? Um, I think I would probably be working either in, the food industry or in like outdoor education with kids. I think we're probably two other career paths I could envision myself in. There's still time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, what's one piece of advice you wish you had starting out or something you wish you had done differently? Um, I think investing in tools to ease stress on the body early on. Um, I think when we were young farmers, um, it's hard to, I mean, it's just hard to run a good business, right? But um, feeling like you can invest in, um, in equipment that can take take stress off the body and um, just managing your body stresses better, you know, making two trips instead of one with twice as much weight, that kind of thing. I think uh, as an almost 50 year old and how my body feels, I think that's probably, probably the thing I wish I had done differently the most. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of, um, Body work is needed <laughs> in the 40s, yeah. I've found. <laughs> yeah, work smarter, not harder in the old saw. So. Yep. <laughs> oh, how do you relate to that, which is out of your control? Um, so there's a lot that's out of our control as farmers, right? It's not a good line of work for people who need to be in control of things. So um, I think approaching the work with humility is probably how we approach it a lot Um, and sort of avoiding the sunken cost fallacy maybe to some extent and just being able to let go of things rather than feeling like everything needs to be saved when it's gotten when it's gone wrong sort of out of your control and just being able to let crops go or um, you know, not invest a huge amount of resources in saving something of, you know, marginal value or gain, I think is, is a lot of it. Yeah. What do you feel is your gift to give on behalf of people and the land? So I would say as someone working in, um, seed at a time when that's not super common on farms. I feel like my gift to offer is sort of a a connectivity between the past and the future that's sort of embodied in these, you know, little bundles of relationship of human and plant history. Um, 
and like maybe we think of ourselves as sort of placeholders in that role of being the people who are responsible for um, both maintaining and living in relationships with these seeds and providing them to our farming and gardening communities until that's something that's taken up by farmers themselves again, maybe. Um, but yeah, just this sense of kind of connectivity between our past and future, I feel like is uh, how I think of the work a lot and, and maybe the gift that it is. Yeah. And finally, how will you grow old farming? Um, how am I growing old farming? <laughs> I, I was, say? well, it's like, you're, you're not <laughs> quite 50 honest. yet. So I'll like, I'll go on the other side of the question. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, getting there. Um, I think um, a mental shift of, of trying to do everything to doing fewer things better um, and also trying to build our business, which is, of course, not just Christine and myself, but our great team that we work with, um, just creating a structure that's more horizontal um, instead of vertical. I don't want to. I feel liberated over time as there are less things dependent on me and sort of creating a crew of sort of managers rather than being the manager of a crew of laborers um i think has really been a huge huge shift um to feel like we are able to continue doing the work and have less dependent on us as individuals with all the both mental and physical burden that goes along with that and really um, kind of approaching things as a uh, sort of more horizontally organized team of people. Yeah. And what do you, what do you see as the future for uprising seeds? Do you, do you want it to stay within your family? Do you want it to, I guess I'm curious about what do you see the future of its growth or. Yeah. I don't think we have no major plans to change things up too radically. Um, it seems like a business that potentially could have a succession plan in that it's um, somewhat established. It's something that somebody could probably come into and continue and kind of take it in a different direction or, or continue in a similar direction. But we kind of see ourselves, I see, we see ourselves in it for a while, at least kind of continuing as is without too many too many major changes. It's a pretty specialty kind of line of work, I would say. So maybe it's not most of our friends who maybe have the experience and know how to run a seed business already are. <laughs> so, I mean, there's that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, no plans really. Well, I'll have to check in with you when you're approaching 60 maybe and see, yeah, there you go. <laughs> see what your answer is then. <laughs> Well, good. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, it's been great to have your perspective on the show and, uh, yeah, learn so much about seeds. I, I am <laughs> woefully naive and so much about seed production. So I appreciate being able to learn from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Clara. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you.